This is our ongoing series in the book of Revelation, and for this particular lesson, we will build off what we studied about last time regarding the rapture by asking the question, will the church go through the tribulation? And I believe that there are at least seven biblical or scriptural reasons for the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. So let me invite you to take your Bibles and open them with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Whether you are a sinner or a saint, you will face death. And you will spend eternity either in heaven by God's grace or in hell because of your rejection of Jesus Christ. But there will be one generation of believers in Christ who have the wonderful privilege of not experiencing death. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Dear friends, the gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ, about the fact that he is God who became fully man, yet without sin. And as a man, he could die, and in doing so, he died for our sins, and he was buried as proof of that death, and he rose victorious. He was seen of over 500 plus witnesses, and we indeed are to trust in this crucified and risen Savior for our eternal destiny. We know that there was a problem at Corinth regarding false teaching, in which verse 12 says, Now of Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. You see, there was already infiltrating that church by virtue of Greek philosophy, the Gnostic heresy that really denied that a spirit was good, supposedly, and physical or body was bad, and therefore they did not believe in a future resurrection. And Paul argues and says, if there is no future resurrection, how could there be a past resurrection? And the gospel is an integral part of uh, the gospel is the saving message, and an integral part of that is to believe Christ rose from the dead. So he goes over all these scenarios if indeed Christ hadn't been raised from the dead. And then in verse 20 he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, namely the Lord Jesus, also came the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 23, but each one in his order, please note this, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his parousia, at his coming. And then he describes later in the chapter what the nature of the resurrected body will be and how that comes to pass. And then in verse 51, we pick it up. Behold, I tell you a mystery, something previously concealed, but which has now been revealed. What is the mystery? We shall not all sleep. And the word sleep, again, is a synonym for physical death. Not everyone will experience physical death, but we shall all be changed experiencing a glorification, transformation of the body. When will this happen? Well, it'll happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It'll happen at the last trump, trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Very similar language to 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ rise first and we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now what happens with this change? Verse 53, for this corruptible body must put on incorruption. This mortal body is the idea, must put on immortality. 
This corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So again, notice the now revealed truth is there will be a generation of individuals who will not experience physical death but they will experience bodily transformation at the event we call the rapture. Now, Jesus Christ promised this in John 14 when he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so we see again the promised return of our Lord Jesus to receive us to be with him at what's called again this resurrection rapture event. Now, we think about Christ coming again and being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there's some questions that uh, we have regarding the, gospel, uh, the rapture. Like, when will the rapture occur? Will the church go through half of the tribulation? Will the church go through two-thirds or three-quarters of the tribulation? Will the church go through all of the tribulation? Will the church be raptured before the tribulation? And that's what we're seeking to resolve in this study. Will the church go through the tribulation? And there are individuals who hold all of those particular views. So what does the Bible say? How do we know that's what it says? Can we be assured of the fact that the church will be raptured before the tribulation occurs? Now keep in mind, as I pointed out last time, but with a little different wording this time, you need to distinguish those two phases again of Christ's second coming. The rapture is private in the sense that the whole world does not see this, where the second advent is public, every eye will see him coming. The rapture happens where we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, where at the second advent he comes back to the Mount of Olives and places his feet there. The rapture, the church is brought to heaven, and the second advent, the church returns with Christ to the earth. At the rapture, the Holy Spirit is removed, as we will see in this study, where in the second advent, Satan actually is removed at the beginning of the kingdom. At the rapture, the believer's body is changed. At the second advent, the earth is going to be changed. At the rapture, Christ appears as the groom, at the second advent, Christ appears as the Messiah. And the rapture is at the end of the church age, where the second advent puts an end to the Jewish age, per se, and the beginning of the kingdom on earth. So with the rapture, Israel's under the fifth cycle of discipline yet, in which they are dispersed. But in the second advent, there will be the end of the fifth cycle of discipline. They will be gathered together and finally enjoy the land from the great river of Egypt to the uh, Euphrates River or the Tigris River there. And as a result, they will finally enjoy their kingdom. At the rapture, we have some very comforting words where when it comes to the tribulation, it's a time of terror. So at the rapture, believers are taken from the earth to meet the Lord in the air, where at the second advent, unbelievers will be taken from the earth, for at the beginning of the kingdom, only believers will populate the earth. And so we see clearly again, there is a distinction between the rapture and the second advent, both part of the parousia, or the coming of our Lord, which is in two phases. Now, as we think of the truth of the rapture, again, we noted last time many things about it. We noted why Paul wrote this. We noted what was involved. 
4, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the, Here's the order. Number one. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. Number two. The dead in Christ will rise first, thinking of their bodies. Then we who are alive and remain shall be, number three, caught up, rapturo, or harpazo in the Greek, together with them in the clouds to then meet the Lord in the air. So we're going to get caught up. Number four, we'll meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Wherefore, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so again, this is the amazing blessed hope of Christ's return. And this is the rapture part of that event. Now keep in mind, the Bible clearly predicts this, but when does the rapture occur with respect to the tribulation? Well, as we think of the various views about it, let me remind you there is what's called the pre-tribulational view. Pre, again, means before. That's easy to remember. And in this view, the rapture happens before the tribulation, as it were. And so we see here, it happens there at the beginning, or before, I should say, the tribulation period. And as a result, our understanding of the wrath of God would be that it'll transpire in the entirety of this time. After the rapture comes the tribulation, then the abomination of desolation, then the great tribulation. And all of this is a time of God's wrath. Now keep in mind, God has not appointed us to wrath. And for that to be true, the rapture cannot happen at the midpoint, two-thirds are at the end of the tribulation. This is our conviction, and we'll develop it today. We know, again, at the end of the tribulation here, there's going to be that battle of Armageddon in Christ's second coming. Secondly, there is what's called the mid-tribulational view. And this view teaches that the church will be raptured three and a half years into the tribulation period. So again, they think the church will go through the first half of the tribulation, but somewhere in the middle there, there will be the rapture of the church. So we'll experience wrath, as it were, for three and a half years, per se. And then we will be delivered, they will say, from God's wrath. They try to distinguish the word wrath here to say this was man's wrath or Satan's wrath, but, but the last half is God's wrath. And I believe the Bible makes it very clear that all of this comes from the hand of God. Then there's the post-tribulational view. And this view teaches that the church will be caught away after the tribulation period. And the word post means after again. So as we think of this, again, they would take the view that all of this is a time of God's wrath, that the church is going to go through the entirety of the tribulation and then finally gets raptured at the end in order to basically come back and enjoy the kingdom per se. Now, if that was true, in a sense, God pours out his wrath on his bride for seven years, and then he has a wedding feast. It's kind of the worst case of spousal abuse in the history of the world, if that is the case. Then there is the what's called the partial rapturism, or partial rapture view. And this view teaches that only certain believers, the spiritual Christians, will be raptured before the tribulation, while the carnal ones must go through it. And again, they would view this as uh, that it, the, the rapture is pre-tribulational, but it, it, 
it doesn't include, as it were, spiritual Christians. I mean, excuse me, carnal Christians. It only includes the spiritual ones. So if you're not spiritual enough, whatever that means, and however that's measured, then you get excluded from the rapture. And so the rapture now isn't an act of grace. It's a reward for your spirituality. And as a result, this is, again, I believe, totally contrary to the word of God. The, power, the rapture of carnal Christians then happens at the very end, as it were, in order to go into the kingdom. And then the fifth view is what's called pre-wrath. Again, this is relatively new of the last 30 years or so. It teaches the church will go through most, about two-thirds of the tribulation period, being raptured before the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. In doing so, again, they're going to be viewing this, that Satan's wrath is in the first part of it. Man's wrath is in the second part of it. Then there's the rapture that happens. And then finally, only the last set of judgments per se are God's wrath on the earth. And then the battle of Armageddon in the second coming. Now, as we think about this issue, why are there various and conflicting views on this issue? And I taught this when I taught on how to interpret prophecy there back in lesson, I think it was three. Part of it is different methods of interpretation. See, you need to interpret the scriptures consistently in a literal, normal, grammatical, historical, contextual kind of way. There can be figures of speech, per se, but that's different than allegorical, hidden meanings in the text that can be only derived to a large degree from the imagination of the interpreter, not from the text itself. As a result, there is theological bias and there's a bent, they eisegete, they force their views on the scriptures, and there's a failure to study the scriptures carefully. Some cases, assuming the rapture and the second advent are the same event, which clearly they are not, and when one would be carefully, rightly dividing the word of truth, these two cannot be the same event. Clearly they are different. And that's why we need to be like the Bereans who were eager to hear what Paul had to say. And they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And many of them therefore believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. I would encourage you today to hear what I have to say and then to examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Is there truly a good basis from the Bible? And by the way, you should be doing this with everything you hear. Over any pulpit and any teacher, nobody gets a pass. Now, it's true, when someone has taught you the word of God consistently, there's going to be building up a confidence that what they're teaching you is true. But even then, you still have to go back to what does the Bible say? By the way, does it really matter if the church escapes the tribulation or not? I think it tremendously matters. I mean, don't you want to escape that seven-year period of the wrath of God? You see, God says, I don't want you to be ignorant. It definitely matters to him. This we say to you by the word of the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words are all indicators of not only the authorial intent of this passage, but how important it is that you know what's being said. Now, right on the heels of this in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, like I just did in chapter 4 on the rapture, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And so God has certain tr truth he wants revealed. The rapture was a new truth, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, now in 1 Thessalonians 4. The day of the Lord was not a new truth, as it was revealed to them in both the Old and the New Testament. But if the scriptures 
underscores something and highlights something, we need to realize how important it is. Now, a third question I'd like to raise is, will the church go through tribulation? And sometimes I've heard this argument. Well, the Bible says the church is going to go through tribulation. Dear friends, there's quite a difference between the church going through tribulation and the church going through the tribulation. In John 16, the Lord Jesus may declare these things, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. All believers experience tribulation. In fact, in Acts 14.22, Paul and Barnabas were strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Many tribulations. And that's why after you get saved, you experience suffering and affliction and tribulations, not only being in this body, but being in the world and taking a stand for Jesus Christ in a world that's hostile to Jesus Christ. Romans 5 reminds us, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. But notice the plural there, very clear. It's not talking about the tribulation, but tribulations as a believer post-justification. 2 Timothy 3, 12, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so we can expect that. On the other hand, I'm glad to tell you this morning that we do not have to look forward to the great tribulation or the tribulation because I am convinced from the Bible we will escape it and I will show you why very soon. Fourth question, can you have biblical certainty regarding the timing of the rapture? And the answer is yes, regarding the timing in relationship to the tribulation. I will teach unequivocally today that it, the rapture is pre-tribulational. But will I teach you it's going to happen next month or on a certain day? No, 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 no. The day and the hour, no one knows regarding his return. Now, many people have predicted it, not only the Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, but even individuals and so forth, even not long ago. By the way, if you ever notice, they normally connected to Rosh Hashanah there in September and normally connected there because, again, they're using biblical, they're using typology, but it's going beyond what the Bible's teaching. And we encourage you never to be involved in date setting, per se. Many mistakes are made predicting that Christ would come on a certain day. And so, yes, we can have certainty as to the timing of the rapture in relationship to the tribulation, but we do not know the day or the hour. We know it is imminent. It can happen at any time. Now, discerning the timing of the rapture, I would like to present to you now seven lines of reasoning, seven passages of Scripture and more even, that teaches that the church will not go through the tribulation. Why? Number one, because believers in Christ have been specifically promised salvation from the coming wrath of the tribulation period. Now, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 with me, we note that right on the heels of chapter 4 that deals with the resurrection slash rapture event, we read, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety because of the signing of the peace agreement at the beginning of the tribulation period, as Daniel 9 predicts, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as you think of the four horsemen, and the first one obviously involves war and then death, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And so... Keep in mind that he dealt with the rapture event up here. Now he deals with the day of the Lord that's going to involve 
the tribulation, and then ultimately the kingdom. Now, I would propose to you that there is a chronological sequence that is occurring. First, the rapture, then the day of the Lord, in that order, for a reason. And by the way, the word but here is a Greek peri-day. And peri-day is used in the Bible at times in order to show that there's a change in subject. Now, it couldn't be related, but it's not the same. We're changing subjects from the resurrection rapture event to the day of the Lord event. They are not the same. So the day of the Lord begins when we, they are saying peace and safety happens suddenly, happens at the beginning of the tribulation, not at the end. It's the early labor pains when a woman isn't expecting it. So notice very clearly here again, he talks about the rapture. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you, who's you? You who have believed, you who are going to be resurrected and raptured, you Thessalonian believers I'm writing to, have no need that I should write to you concerning the day of the Lord, for as yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Notice, comes upon them in the tribulation. And they, in the tribulation, shall not escape. And yet, the very next verse, verse 4, says, but you. There's the they, the them, and the you. There are those in the tribulation and you who are going to escape it. Now, keep in mind again, the tribulation period begins with the signing of the peace treaty. It's the first horse of the apocalypse in Revelation chapter 6. It's a false peace brokered by the Antichrist. Then sudden destruction comes, liking to labor pains upon a woman with child, and they, the unsaved, shall not escape. But you, brethren, notice the difference, are not in darkness, so that this day, what day? The day of the Lord not the rapture, should overtake you as a thief. See, a thief doesn't come and knock on the front door, per se. He comes at a time you're not expecting, and indeed, signing the peace treaty, they're not expecting the wrath of God and the four horsemen to come their way, but they do. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not, now Paul includes himself here, are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us as believers not sleep spiritually like the unsaved world around us do, but let us as believers watch and be sober for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night, but let us, as believers who are of the day, namely saved, be sober. The means to be mentally alert, to be spiritually awakened, to be in the game mentally. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, for God did not appoint us to wrath. In the context, wrath of what? the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, but to obtain salvation, deliverance, rescue from the day of the Lord. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how. Not only does he save us from hell and the wrath of God there, he saves us from wrath in any kind of way, whether in this life or even here in the day of the Lord who died for us, that whether we wake 
Get with it spiritually or we sleep spiritually. Now the word sleep here is a different word than the word sleep in 1 Thessalonians 4. The Greek word there in 1 Thessalonians 4 speaks of physical death. The word sleep here is a different Greek word, and it means that you're spiritually awake. So whether you are spiritually, excuse me, spiritually awake or you sleep, we would call this spiritual or carnal. We should live together with him. The we is saved, both spiritual and carnal. See, dear friends, there, are, there can be no partial rapture. This passage destroys it. That no believer in Christ is going to have any part of the day of the Lord. Now, there will be people who get saved during the tribulation period, but they're not in Christ. And they will experience not the wrath of God directly, as it were, but indirectly by virtue of living there during the tribulation. But notice again, we see, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. So we are children of the day, saved by grace. Jesus is coming one day for us, and we are going to miss the tribulation period, so we should live now in light of that. And again, these encouragements about the rapture and the return of Christ are all designed to not only give us tremendous hope about our future, but to motivate us to minister to one another or to get the gospel out. Wherefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing, in view of the wonderful truth that we will escape the tribulation to come. And Jesus said it this way, let your light so shine before men, they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we are promised salvation from the coming wrath of the tribulation period. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 9 and 10 make that very, very clear. And so again, we see, as we think of the tribulation we think of the intervention of God in human history by way of judgment and of blessing, thinking of the day of the Lord. It's not referring to a single day, but a period of time begins with the tribulation. It's over a thousand years, at least a thousand seven years. Again, it's like a Jewish day, which begins at sundown or dark, then sunrise and noon, then afternoon. The day of the Lord has this sundown side to it, called the tribulation, then the sunrise side to it, namely Christ comes again, and then very bright in the kingdom, per se. And so again, we have a wonderful future to look forward to. And then after the great white throne, there will be the new heaven and new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, per se. And so keep in mind that the day of the Lord is a period of time, not a literal day. It involves the intervention of God in human history. And it begins with the tribulation. And you, as a believer, will not experience this. So as we think of these prophetic views of the rapture, is there comfort in view, too, that you're going through half of it? How do you comfort one another? Hey, cheer up. It's only three and a half years of the wrath of God. Or post-tribulational view, hey, cheer up. We're going to go through the entire tribulation, but then Jesus will take us up like a Ferris wheel, and we'll come right back down. Or the partial rapture theory, in which, you know, just comfort one another with these words. This is a wonderful thing, as long as you're spiritual. But if you're not, therefore, you won't get raptured, but you won't know if you will, until it happens, and therefore continue to live in anxiety. There is no comfort in these views, as well as in the pre-wrath view as well. So is there wrath in the first half of the tribulation? And the Bible is very clear here that there is wrath. In fact, if you go to Revelation chapter 6 for a quick moment, we see here that 
Revelation 4 and 5 is going to deal with the church in heaven. Revelation 6 through 18 is the tribulation on earth. And we see again, verse 1, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now this is not the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Antichrist. And notice, he goes without a bow because he doesn't use military force to accomplish this peace. He does diplomacy, as it were. And then you have, verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And again, we've got another fiery red horse went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was, they were given to him a great sword. And then the third seal is broken on the title deed of the earth. And there's a famine. And then the fourth seal, there's death. And the fifth seal, there are some martyrs that show up. The sixth seal, there's tremendous anarchy and so forth. And we read in verse 16, and it said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You see, after they see all these different judgments that occur, finally they catch on to the fact that this is the wrath of God. Now, if you knew your Bible, you would know that was true even before that. But one thing is clear is he's setting forth the fact that these sealed judgments, which happen in the first half of the tribulation, involves the wrath of God. Now, this, what you're going to have then is the, at the midpoint, the abomination of desolation, then the seventh Seal judgment occurs, and from that comes the trumpets and the bowls. Now, there's some debate whether the trumpets happen right here or they happen right here. But the seal judgments clearly happen in the first half of the tribulation period, followed by the great tribulation per se. And again, we just noted this. The great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Even the unsaved understand what is happening. Now, it's interesting to compare Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. When you compare the two, you will see, again, that these seals, judgments of Revelation 6, totally relate to what's happening in the first half of Matthew 24. And then finally, in Matthew 24, it says that there's the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I think it's 2413. And all these things have happened before that, which means it happens before the abomination of desolation. And these correspond, again, with the horsemen of the apocalypse, showing us the seals clearly are all part of the first half of the tribulation. And they're called, actually, by... Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, the beginning of birth pangs. Remember, we had seen that phrase earlier. So we have been promised to be saved from wrath. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And so again, as you look at these very events recorded in the Olivet Discourse, whether it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and you look at Revelation chapter 6, you will see this tremendous correspondence between the two. And keep in mind that the first half is a time of the beginning of birth pangs. It's a time of judgment from God, but it intensifies with the trumpets, and then the bold judgments that are forthcoming as well.
For us to be saved from the wrath of God involves being saved from the day of the Lord. And this requires that the church be raptured before the tribulation occurs. Now we've already seen what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians. So let's move on now to 2 Thessalonians, if you would turn there in your Bible, chapter 2. And like 1 Thessalonians, you're going to see some explanation that is given. You're going to see some chronology that occurs, giving us, again, some evidence to the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Now, the passage we just read on the rapture in the day of the Lord was found in 1 Thessalonians. They had heard these things, but something occurred between that letter received by them and the second letter being written. What happened? Verse 1, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, namely the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, and again, most translations have it, and it's correctly so, based on manuscript evidence, the day of the Lord had come. You say, well, what happened? Well, someone gave a prophecy or a word of knowledge or a spurious letter of some kind, signed it by Paul, and in doing so, they had said in effect, you know, you're experiencing a lot of tribulations in Thessalonica. It's very serious. It indicates Paul was wrong in his eschatology. I just got a word from the Lord, and the Lord told me that we're actually in the tribulation, and Paul was not right on this matter. And so it was either prophetic utterance, it said, by spirit, or word, or by letter. Now, dear friends, if they were anticipating going through the tribulation, why were they shaken or troubled at all? They were shaken and troubled, I'll tell you why. Because of 1 Thessalonians 4, it made it very clear that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him was before the day of the Lord. So verse 3 says, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away, the apostasia, comes first. And I'll comment on that in a minute. Then what follows? And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And what do we call that again? The abomination of desolation. Now keep in mind that the word apostasia means a falling away. It speaks of metaphorically a turning away from the truth. It can mean literally a departure. Now, the departure can be from the truth, and that's how we theologically use the word apostasy, about people who have turned away from the truth of the word of God. But I want you to know that that word apostasia, more often than not, actually refers to a departure from one place locationally to the other. And as a result, we see that basically there's two departures before the day of the Lord. One is going to be doctrinally, but one is actually going to be actually or locationally. from one place to another. Again, there's the departure of the saints from the earth. We call that the rapture. And then there's the world's departure from the word of God, allowing Satan's lie to be so fully embraced that the Antichrist will come into power. You see, the reason I don't think apostasy is referring to just doctrinal apostasy is because throughout the church age, there's been apostasy. I mean, if you don't think that, just think of the Middle Ages where Rome ruled and hardly anyone knew the gospel and where there was total apostasy, as it were. 
with rare exception, you would think if apostasy was a sign, then that should have been the sign, but it wasn't. Because apostasy has happened throughout the centuries. I think it's clearly the sign to know involves the departure of the saints, namely the rapture. And following that then will be the departure of the world to embrace the Antichrist. And so the falling away has to come first. And then, after the falling away, comes the signing of the peace treaty, the revealing of the man of sin at that point, and then at the midpoint, he enters the temple, declares himself to be God, and he is, in a sense, fully revealed. You see, there was a sense in which the Lord Jesus Christ was clearly revealed when he was incarnated or revealed when he began his public ministry. But he was also revealed during what's called Palm Sunday when he came into Jerusalem riding the coal of an ass, the foal of an ass. So he, they should have known that. And indeed, there will be a revealing of the Antichrist fully at the midpoint when he declares himself to be God and demands universal worship. And so what has to happen before that? The departure. What is the departure in reference to? I believe the rapture. And so we see, again, that the departure demands the pre-tribulational rapture. But along with that, is we believe the church will not go through the tribulation because with the departure of the saints goes the departure of the restrainer, who is the Holy Spirit to be taken out of the way requires for the church to be removed from the earth as well. We know that the Lord Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, according to John 16, verse 8, to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. We then read now in 1 Thessalonians, and by the way, we know the Holy Spirit indwells every believer, seals every believer, and baptizes every believer into the body of Christ. So if the church is not going to go through the tribulation, then the Holy Spirit's ministries have to change. Because he can't keep baptizing believers into the body of Christ if there is no body of Christ, the church, to be baptized into. So we read in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So these are things that Paul says he taught them when he was there. But they again were shaken and troubled from a prophetic utterance of some so-called or a spurious letter as from Paul. And now you know what is restraining that he, the Antichrist, the man of sin, may be revealed in his own time. What's holding this all back from happening? For the mystery of lawlessness, the satanic plan to make the Antichrist head of the world is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is out of the way. Notice the he here is capitalized purposely in our Bibles because it's referring to the Holy Spirit. You see, in order to restrain Satan's diabolical plan, you have to be stronger than Satan. While the third member of the Trinity, namely the Holy Spirit, is indeed just that. And so he's continuing to restrain like he did back in Genesis 6-3, my spirit shall not strive with men forever. And finally, he's taken out of the way when the rapture occurs, and though the Holy Spirit is omnipresent and he's still present and still a means by which people are getting saved, he's taken out of the way in the sense that he's removed from that restraining ministry. He's removed by way of the rapture of the church whom he indwells. And then that lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
Now, some have suggested the restrainer is Michael the archangel. Some have suggested it's human government, dear friends. Human government normally is the problem, not the solution. The Holy Spirit indwells the church today. If these believers had expected to go through the tribulation, which they didn't, why were they soon shaken by this false teaching? Because they were falsely told something contrary to what Paul had taught. That's why, again, you've got to go back to what does the Bible say. I don't care who says it, how popular they are. What does the Bible say? And Paul had taught them they would escape the day of the Lord through the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. If they had been taught they would go through part or all of the tribulation, they shouldn't be shaken, they should be rejoicing. As their redemption was near, but that is not how they were responding they were shook because they were in the day of the Lord supposedly and that Paul had been wrong and that their blessed hope had just been crushed. So again, keep in mind, as we think of the Old Testament, there was this tremendous focus on Israel. Then the resurrected Christ, Revelation 1, the present church age, Involves, again, the rapture of the church will culminate this. And then Revelation 4 and 5, which we'll look at in a minute, has the church in heaven. It has the judgment seat of Christ and such all involved there. And while that's going on, there's going to be the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, the seven years on earth. At the end of it, Christ returns again, and keep in mind, with that return, there will then be the sheep and goat judgments per se, and Satan will be bound for a thousand years while the millennium is in place, and then Satan will be defeated, new heavens and new earth, eternity future will occur. Now, what we're reading fits what we're seeing here. And again, the unsaved will spend significant amount of times in Hades, and then finally they get resurrected and cast into the lake of fire after the great white throne judgment. But keep in mind, we believe the rapture is pre-tribulational. Why? Number one, chronologically, 1 Thessalonians 4 precedes chapter 5. Chronologically, 2 Thessalonians 2 starts out with the departure, then the revealing of the man of sin. Furthermore, because believers in Christ have been promised salvation from the coming wrath of the tribulation period, it's been predicted the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way in order for the man of sin to be revealed, and this requires for the church to remove from the earth as well. Now, another line of reasoning here is because believers have been promised to be kept from the hour of trial. If you'd like to turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, this is a very significant passage. And this passage was given, Revelation 3, beginning in verse 6. Verse 7, to the church in Philadelphia, a literal, actual church in Asia Minor. And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You've kept my word. You have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, namely the tribulation to come, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers are the unsaved people living 
during the tribulation. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Now, this phrase, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. There's something I need to point out here that's very, very significant. The way it is translated and in our Bibles by way of verse, versification, the breaking down of the verses. By the way, in the original manuscripts, there were no periods at the end of sentences. There were no verses per se. This would have been just one whole series of words and later broken up with periods, semicolons, and things like that. As time would go on in the church age, somebody sat down or some people sat down and decided to put verses in the Bible. And, I would say, and also chapter divisions. Now sometimes they get chapter divisions wrong. They got it wrong at the end of Hebrews 4. They got it wrong at the end of first, 2 Corinthians 6. Clearly chapter 7 verse 1 is a concluding verse of the thought in chapter 6. But for the most part, they did a great job. But I would like to point out to you that I think there is good exegetical reason that they got the period wrong in this verse. You see, in verse 9 it says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you, period. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, this appears as if, and is misunderstood by the, mid, by the partial rapturists, to show that only if you keep Christ's command to persevere will you then be kept from the hour of trial. So again, it becomes a reward even if you're not a partial rapturist, it looks as if the reason Christ keeps you from the hour of trial is because you've kept his command. It looks meritorious again. Then the, 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 the uh, rapture isn't a grace event per se. I would highly suggest to you, yea, I am thoroughly convinced upon doing more study, that the period should happen after the word persevere. You see the word because here, in John's writing, hardly ever begins a sentence. It's always built into the sentence. So verse 9 would read, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. Period. Now, here's an independent promise. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, that's the tribulation to come, which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. And I believe if you understand it this way, not only is there great exegetical support throughout the New Testament with putting the word because at the end of the sentence or embedding it in the sentence, not beginning the sentence, but also it makes sense doctrinally as well. Now, let's look at the promise, though. I also will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, that is referring to the tribulation to come. The word hour means a time period. So, he's promising you to keep you from the time period of trial, the tribulation. The word from, I'm going to be technical for a minute, is the Greek word ek. Now, the Greek word ek speaks of from, out from. The word through is the Greek word dia, and the word in is the Greek word ice. Christ will not keep us through or in the hour of trial, but from it. Now, that word ek is translated out of or emerged from 
800 times in the New Testament. The word ek is only translated one time by the word through in Galatians 3.8. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm saying all but one time, it always means out from. I will keep you out from, not the tribulation, but even the very hour of it. The very period of time that's involved in it. Now, if you wanted to, I'll keep you through the tribulation. He could have used the word dia or ice or even a p. He would not have used the word ek, which surely conveys the idea of out of or out from. So this is a promise by Jesus Christ to this church to be kept or preserved or reserved out of the hour of trial which is coming. Now this is like Enoch who was translated into heaven and kept from the very hour of the judgment of the earth by way of the flood. This was unlike Noah who was kept through the judgment of the flood. To be kept from the hour of trial requires we are at a place where time ceases, namely heaven. How did we get there? Well, the rapture. When must we be raptured to be kept from the very hour of it? Well, before the tribulation. At Christ's coming. And Christ fulfilled his promise, or will fulfill his promise to the Philadelphian church, he fulfilled it to them because they died. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and thus they're going to be kept from the very hour of the tribulation. Just like he promised. But so will those who are alive and remain. So does Jesus Christ fulfill his promises to us to be kept from the hour of the trial? And the answer is absolutely yes. And he does it again, in this case, because the dead in Christ rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And keep in mind that these seven churches were seven actual churches, but they're also representative of churches today and individual believers today, like Ephesus, who leave their first love, or Smyrna, who suffer for the Savior, or Pergamos, who's well wedded to the world, or Thyatira, who tolerates false teaching, or Sardis, who has a name that they live, but they're dead, or Philadelphia, who God opens doors and no one can close them, or Laodicea, who is lukewarm. They're all representative of churches today as well. But what is promised here? is to be kept from the very hour of the tribulation period by being caught up to meet the Lord in the air or to die in Christ first. Now, that being said, we see another reason why the church will not go through the tribulation. And this is an interesting one because of the usage of the word church and the chronology of the book of Revelation. Now, how is the word church distributed in the book of Revelation? Now, again, in Revelation chapter 1, write the things which you have seen. That's Revelation 1. Number 2, write the things which are. That's Revelation 2 and 3. Followed by the rapture. And then in Revelation 4 and 5, we're going to see the church in heaven. Representative or represented by the 24 elders. And then again. There's the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, followed with the Lord's return at the end of it, the sheep and goat judgment, the Satan being bound, the kingdom made on earth, Satan being defeated, the great white throne, and the new heavens and new earth. But it is interesting to note that in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, there are three references made to Israel but there's 19 references made to the church. Now, beginning in chapter 4 through 18, 
in which the church has been raptured, rewarded, and resurrected. And in particular, chapters 6 through 18, there are 26 references made to Israel. There are zero references made to the church. Why isn't that the case? Why isn't the church referred to? It is because the church has been raptured. The church is not on earth. But then, when you go back again to Christ's return, Revelation 19 through 22, only one reference to Israel, but six references to the church. Why? Because the church comes back with him to rule and reign as promised. Now, it's interesting even in Revelation 2 and 3, repeatedly he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But in Revelation 13, after the church has been raptured, he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. What is intentionally dropped is what the Spirit says to the churches because the church is not there in Revelation 13, which is explaining the reign of the Antichrist and the deception of the false prophet. Now, I am of the conviction that the 24 elders are representative of the church. If you look at their description there in Revelation chapter 4, the 24 elders have an interesting appearance. Verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns, of gold on their head. So we see them robed, we see them rewarded, we see them resurrected, you can see them, their bodies, you can see them raptured, as it were, there in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now, what you just read in, in the description of these 24 elders are all promises that Christ made to the churches. If you look in Revelation 3 for just a moment, Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Chapter 4, verse 4, around the throne were 24 thrones. On the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they were crowns of gold on his head. What do they do with the crowns? They're going to cast them at the feet of the Lord Jesus. Who are these 24 elders? They're representative of the church. And by the way, what is one of the terms that is used of the leaders of a church? It's the word elders. So all of this fits really well to show us the elders, Revelation 4 and 5, have been raptured. They're in heaven. And then in chapter 6 through 18 begins the tribulation of earth. Because during that time in Revelation 5, Jesus Christ comes forth and takes the title deed of the earth to reclaim this earth for God. Now that scroll then begins to slowly get unraveled in chapter 6. And with the breaking of each seal, the, another judgment happens. But notice there in chapter 5 of Revelation, when the Lord Jesus takes the title deed of the earth, Verse 6, and I looked and behold in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures... And the 24 elders, clearly the creatures aren't the elders, and neither are they the angels, as we see in other passages, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are, incense, which is, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song saying what? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. What are the 24 elders saying? For you are slain, and you redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. The very kind of wording you see in Revelation 1.5 in reference to the seven churches 
whom this book was being written to. And so I think there's a number of reasons why the 24 elders clearly involve representation of the church. And notice they are in heaven, worshiping, rejoicing, fellowshipping, while the tribulation on earth is going on, which begins in chapter 6 through 18. Chapter 19, the Lord Jesus comes on a white horse and with him an army on white horses, and that's us. We will come back with him, as promised, to rule and reign. Now, a fifth reason why we believe the rapture is pre-tribulational is because the church has no part or purpose in any of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Keep in mind, the church is Christ's heavenly people made up of Jews and Gentiles, made one in the body of Christ and blessed with all spiritual blessings, where Israel consists of both saved and unsaved Jews who are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Keep in mind that promises made to Israel were primarily physical in nature. The promises made to the church are primarily spiritual in nature. Israel and the church are not the same. And I say that because those who think the church will go through the tribulation sometimes confuse that. And our millennialists clearly confuse that because they think the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament are being spiritually fulfilled in the church. And the preterists believe that too. R.C. Sproul, a Reformed theologian, five-point Calvinist, anti-dispensationalist, wrote several years ago, we believe that the church is essentially Israel. We believe that the answer to what, the Jew, what about the Jews is, here we are. Arno Fruchtenbaum, a saved Jew who's dispensational, responded, too bad you are not declaring this on the streets of Berlin around 1941. You want to find the Jews, here we are. Now that was kind of witty, I thought. But he's pointing out the problem. The church is not Israel. Israel is not the church. God has a separate plan for both of them. And keep in mind, uh, again, we've seen about the 70th week of Daniel, and this will be developed in greater detail in this series, that 483 years have already been fulfilled. We recognize that there are seven years yet to be fulfilled. And the fact is the church has had no part in any of this Prior or future, why would it have a part in the tribulation to come when it's had no part in any of the other 70 weeks or 69 weeks of Daniel? Tribulation, again, is the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. One seven-year period called also the tribulation Church has had no part in the first 69 weeks. Why do we believe the church would have any part in the 70th week? It has not. Number six, we believe the church is going to be raptured pre-tribulationally because if the rapture does not take place until the end of the tribulation, how will the millennial earth be populated with people in natural, unglorified bodies? Because you see, you cannot procreate in a glorified body. This argument addresses the post-tribulational view. You see, if we're raptured at the end of the tribulation and we get new glorified bodies and we come down to the millennial kingdom, how do you reproduce? How do you populate? You can't procreate in a glorified body. You need a natural human body. And indeed, what we read in Isaiah 65, and the context is the millennial phase of the kingdom, it says, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. The idea is that death is at a minimum or non-existence during the millennial phase. To have death, you need people in natural bodies. Tribulation saints who survive the tribulation experience the sheep and goat judgments, per se, 
and they enter the kingdom, but they enter it with a body like yours and mine, and that's how they can have children, and that's how there can be a final rebellion at the end of the millennium when Satan's loosed and finds people waiting to, again, go along with his diabolical plan to attack Jerusalem. How does he find these people? Unless they're in unglorified bodies with sin natures, living on the earth that have never trusted in Jesus Christ. You see, they have to choose to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, even though he's ruling and reigning during that time, and many of them will not. So in Revelation chapter 20, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Now this is a different Gog and Magog than mentioned Ezekiel 38 and 39. He'll be there to gather them, unbelieving progeny, together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. That means there are many. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, namely Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So again, we see how can there be population in the kingdom to come. If everyone enters the kingdom in glorified bodies by virtue of being raptured in order to enter the kingdom, the rapture has to happen before that. And while that doesn't dogmatically prove it's pre-tribulational, it clearly proves it's pre-millennial and that pre-tribulational indeed is one of the options and it fits with the other arguments that are given from the Bible in this lesson. Again, the view that best answers this issue is again the pre-tribulation. Now lastly, the church will not go through the tribulation because if the rapture must be preceded by signs, Fulfilled prophecy, etc., connected with the tribulation period. The Lord's return for his church cannot be imminent. Now keep in mind, imminent doesn't mean soon. It means it could happen at any time. Now what are some passages that teach imminency? Well, 2 Corinthians 1.7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you waiting for the Antichrist? Because if you're mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib, then you're really waiting for the Antichrist first and many other things to happen instead of waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the early church thought the rapture could happen at any time, and that's why 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. Now, the New American Standard, it translates this, Maranatha. What does Maranatha mean? Oh, oh Lord, come. Oh, Lord, come. That's what it means. In other words, the word come is in the present tense. Oh, Lord, come. Come at any time. Come today. There's nothing waiting for us, and that's why we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we wouldn't be eagerly waiting for Christ if the Antichrist had to sign the, first, the peace treaty first, the sealed judgment, the trumpet judgments, the bold judgments all have to happen first, and then Christ comes. I mean, we're not hardly eagerly waiting. We have to wait at least seven more years. That's like telling your kid on the night before Christmas, you know, Christmas is soon, but we've got all these gifts, see them there by the tree, but um, you're going to have to wait seven years to open them. I mean, like about a big-time bummer where people aren't going to be excited about that event at all. You see, the early church thought it, Christ could come back at any time. He said, let your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. 
1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath of to come. He can come at any time. Titus 2.13, we're looking for the blessed hope. Why? Because it can happen at any time. James 5.8, be patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It can happen at any time. Revelation 22.20, surely I am coming quickly. It can happen at any time. And so these are seven, eight, nine, possibly ten ways of supporting the fact that the Lord Jesus could come at any time. The rapture could happen today. It's going to be pre-tribulational. And therefore, we look forward to it with great expectation. Now, you might ask, well, who cares if the church goes through the tribulation or not? Well, first of all, God the Father cares, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God, in reference to the Father, did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, God the Son cares, because he's the one who said he's going to keep you from the hour of trial. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit cares, because he is going to continue to restrain until he is taken out of the way. Fourthly, the Church of Jesus Christ should care, because this impacts how we live. You see, if you know that Christ isn't coming back for another 20 years, is it going to impact how you live today? Probably not. But if you know that he could happen any time, and you know that he's going to deliver you from the wrath to come, if you know you're not going to be going through the tribulation, it can impact you where you live and how you live today. Why? Because the pre-tribulational rapture is, first of all, our certain hope. Jesus said, I will come again, and there is no doubt about it. The question simply is when. Because the pre-tribulational rapture is our purifying hope. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That when he comes again, we will be like him. And by the way, preceding 1 John 3, 1 through 3, or chapter 2, verse 28, abide in him that when he appears, we may, be, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It's a purifying hope because with the rapture then follows the judgment seat of Christ. And that has a way of purifying how you live your life. Thirdly, it's our comforting hope. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And in fact, it's also our blessed hope and glorious appearing. The word blessed means it makes us happy. I'm happy to know this is going to be the case. So if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should live in light of the fact that he's coming again. You should live in light of your position in Christ. You're a person of the day, so live like a person of the day. Don't live like a person of the night, because you're not. Live with your eyes wide open. Live in a way that honors the Lord, that makes the most of the situation, that lives in light of the fact of what Christ has done for you, who you are, the opportunities you presently have, and the fact that you have a wonderful future to look forward to. Are you wasting your life, believer, in carnality? If Jesus were to come today, would you be ashamed before him? Or would you meet him with confidence? Are you saved by the grace of God and then abiding in him? Are you letting your life count for Jesus Christ? Are you looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ? Because of the grace of God and you've been walking by faith, you're enjoying fellowship with the Lord and you say, I not only know I'm going to heaven, I'm not only looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ, but I have confidence I'm going to hear a well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let your life count. Be motivated by his love. Be enabled by his spirit. Be directed by his word. Because again, we must all appear before the judgment seat. And if you are not a 
believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to put your faith in him. He's the only one who can deliver you from hell, and he's the only one who can enable you to escape the wrath to come by way of the tribulation. And it's by simply putting your faith in him who died for you and rose again to save you, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. You need to realize you cannot save yourself from hell any more than you can save yourself from the tribulation to come. God loves you. Christ died for you. He rose again. He's willing to save you. Put your faith in him alone. Trust in him and his finished work. Believe in the person of Christ and the promise of God. And know that you're saved from hell. And then as a result, knowing you have eternal life, rejoice, believer, that you will escape the tribulation to come with this incredible event in which the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Father, thank you again. As I know, this was a little heavier study this takes more thought, more understanding. I just pray that whether these students could comprehend every one of these points or not, they could comprehend enough to recognize that the Lord Jesus could come back today, the rapture is pre-tribulational, and that the church will not go through the time of Jacob's trouble and the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation to come. And we know it's not because we've earned it or deserved it. It's all an event of grace. Just like being born again was. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your son. Thank you for what he did for us. Thank you that through faith alone in him, we can be saved and know it forever. Thank you that you give us great reason to now live for him who died for us knowing he can come back at any time and knowing that we will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. And we know that perfect love casts out fear. This fear involves torment. And we know that we are not going to be punished at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be rewarded or perhaps no reward, but not punished because the Lord Jesus bore our punishment and you've been propitiated or satisfied with what he's done. So, Father, thank you again for your word in all these things. In Jesus' name.